So wait, you want me to talk instead of you? So you write the article and I just say the words out loud? Well, mm -hmm. and, and I take I take a nap. You know, isn't that the uh, work share that we have on this podcast here? Excellent. So you take a nap and I take full credit. Is that how it works? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Have you heard about the concept of intellectual property? <laughs> oh, clever, clever. <laughs> Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast, where we demystify enterprise architecture and business process management. We're here to bring best practices and lessons learned from our years to your ears, as well as interviewing friends we've met along the way on our professional journeys. My name is Roland Volt, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Roland. You know, we always talk about the weather, but I do want to reflect a little bit on spring. It has sprung, and my goodness, the trees are starting to look a little bit more bright. The weather is getting warmer and warmer every day, and my walks are getting even more beautiful. How are you feeling, my friend? Well, it's the same here. You know, spring has sprung in Virginia as well. So today I opened my rooftop tent for the first time since winter, you know, to air it out. And Ooh. I got serious camp envy. So I hope that the weather stays nice. So at least tomorrow should be nice. And um, yeah, then we go from there. That sounds really nice, Roland. But before you get a chance to go camping, we're going to record a podcast all about data. Now we're going to finishing our data series with this. I, I know you had a couple of conversations. We've talked to Vipka, who was fantastic. We talked to Lota, who was fantastic. We've had a, a, a few of these little mini uh, excerpts out of data and the world of data and data engineering and data processing and data pre-processing and data analysis and all those sorts of things. Today, we want to walk through data modeling, which is something I know you've really focused on a little bit in the past. And you've got a really series of great articles on whatsyourbaseline.com where you've gone through this, but we haven't had a chance to really discuss this in detail on the podcast. And I thought it wouldn't be a great idea to do so. I think so too. And those are the, the quickest preparations for it because <laughs> I know what I wrote and you just have to read it. So it's all good. Yeah, but in all seriousness, you're absolutely right. I think this is one of the most under estimated, underappreciated topics ever. That's why we had the little mini series about data, right? Yeah. And um, I think the context, just to put it in, in the context, uh, when do you typically start data modeling? I, <laughs> I think nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I need to create an, a data model today. You know, no. not even the hardcore nerds. So I think you start it when you go and uh, you did your analysis, um, you uh, think about, well, what does the future bring? How do I have to change my process? How do I have to change my applications? How do I have to change my data? You know, and I think this is the, the point where people start about thinking modeling data. And there's multiple ways of doing it. And, and the term data model uh, is obviously also not, hmm, how do I say that? Uh, it doesn't have a unique use. You know, so for example, in the past, when I created data models for process mining, then I called that thing data model. But today we're talking about diagrams. We're talking about um, plans. We're talking about, um, yeah, pixels on a virtual piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that one of the things with data modeling, like a lot of other modeling, is it can sometimes be viewed, I don't know, as like a cost center kind of thing. Like this doesn't provide a lot of value. It's kind of the necessary evil of transformation. But I think in today's conversation, we'll hopefully reveal to our audience how valuable data modeling is in the analysis side, making the right decisions. Yeah, I actually disagree with uh, that it's an, an afterthought. You know, hmm. um, I was working, um, I was in 2017, 2018, I forgot. You know, I was working with one of a, a big... Um, certification organization, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they uh, wanted to transform deep in the knee waterfall customer. They wanted to go agile and whatnot. And they, they really took everything, turned around every stone and whatnot. And then we had long conversations about, well, what is a customer? Yeah. And and they said like, uh, mm, yeah, it's this, it's this, it's this. And then, then we came back with that earth-shattering consensus that a customer 
is somebody who's willing to pay money for the products that we offer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that, that's the only unifying characteristic you're well, going to use. I love the point that. is that there was a lot of resistance. You know, the HR people stood up and said, "No, no, 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 no. Our customer is the employee. You know, mm -hmm. we need to have a good customer experience for that, and, and so on and so forth." So I think sure. what helps is, is, and this is where data modeling, in, in the sense that we're going to talk about today, comes in. Is you bring clarity into what do we actually mean, and you also can go and can reuse this. You know, it's like the the Babylonian Tower, you know, where everybody speaks a different language. I think this is a way how you can um, how you can avoid this. And and with that, I think there's uh, three big questions that come into mind when we talk about data modeling. The first one is just like I said, the question: What is the data? You know, what, what do we actually talk about, you know, from a conceptual perspective, you know, what is a customer and, and who's not, uh, but also from a logical perspective, right? So what are, mm -hmm. what are the, the attributes of a customer, you know, like name and date of birth and address and all those type of things? Yeah. Because you will need to define this because at some point in time, you have some damn applications that, that might want to store this, right? And that brings us to the second point, right? It is, well, where is the data stored? And, and in between, how is it transformed? Yeah. You know, I could tell a little story about uh, an SAP implementation that I worked like 20 years ago, where then the SAP person at the table also said, yeah, I don't know. You know, I can tell you where we store that data, but I have no clue how the tool internally transforms the data and, and might populate it in uh, a different table, a temporary table within it, which obviously when you think about personal information and all those wonderful things, that was not a great answer, right? Ooh. To be quite honest. And, and we yeah. were talking, we were talking with the medical branch of the German armed forces at that point in time, you know, so they do have some sensitive information to be stored. And, and uh, so obviously, so number one is what is it? Logical decomposition. Number two is the application side, the data storage, how is it transformed? And then obviously the, the third point is, well, where do I ask for data? Right. So forms, mm -hmm. for example, right? And and how is it used in the process? Right. So three things that that I think are valuable to do the data modeling exercise because it obviously answers those questions. Yeah, and data modeling gives you that template, or at least the way we're going to look at it today, gives you a template that asks the right kinds of questions at the right time so you know what you're looking for. I feel mm -hmm. like one of the big barriers to entry for people even starting this kind of process is I don't even know where to put my information. I don't know the format within which to store it. Like, you know, kind of the, the data modeling of data modeling, as in like, what attributes am I capturing about the data, the metadata of the data? And how do I represent that in a way that is transferable? You talked earlier about the Tower of Babel, but this is another one of those business needs to bring information together in a consumable format so that a bunch of different stakeholders who need access to that information in different capacities can see the same thing, have the same conversation, or at least a conversation about that same thing, and be able to extract their particular value and take it away to their various teams. And if you want to think about data modeling as a collecting ground for stakeholder interactions, I think that's a fantastic spot to start our conversation because that starts down the path of conceptual data. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps maybe the most wide reaching of the conversations around data, because there's so many stakeholders can, who can want to put their fingers in the pie of this. <laughs> so yeah. Roland, why don't you start with a definition for me? What is conceptual data and how do we start a conversation about conceptual data modeling? So there's typically three things that how people describe it conceptual logical physical right and it's not a it's not a hard rule so whoever listens to this and knows more about data i'm, I'm happy to learn from you but basically conceptual is obviously a very high level um description of it you know you're talking about the high level nerd alert entities you know which are the the, the things you know uh, for example what is a customer Right. So what you want to do is you want to create 
uh, a diagram and let's put it in a in a context of a, a BPM or EA tool implementation. Yeah, right? sure. So so what do we talk about? Oh, we're talking about a thing like a process. What's a process? We're talking about a thing like an application. Oh, mm -hmm. what is an application? You know, is there a relationship between the two? Right? Is there a relationship between an entity with itself? The answer is yes, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you might have a process hierarchy, right? So level one, level two, level three, level four processes, right? So it's related to itself. So now the question is, on which level do you have that relationship between the application and which level of process, right? So these are things right. that you obviously will have to, to think through. And the conceptual um, data model helps getting clarity into those high level things. Yeah. And, yeah. And when you look at it and, and um, let's take any tool, right? What you typically use is a, a diagram type, like an IE data model. Yep. Um, and you would take these. Um, you could obviously also use different things. UML is a, a very nice notation for this. Uh, I think most people have seen this. Um, and you would say, hey, the relationship between this is that a one-to-one, -one, a many-to-one, mm -hmm. a one-to-many, a many-to-many, -many, right? So all that stuff. Conceptual means get the high-level things defined, right? A customer is somebody who's willing to pay for our wares, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that everybody uses it the same. But you also come back with the relationships, you know, are there, mm -hmm. well, for customers, it, it's a little bit word. Are there customers, customers, customers on multiple level and which one, which, <laughs> whatever. But you get the point, right? Yeah. And and you, you mentioned a little bit about the, the modeling styles here. So I data models and sort of crow's foot style relationships, which indicate the, the, the type of relationship between two entities. One thing that I want to make sure we highlight here is that this conceptual data model is a great way of preventing us from defining our solution before we define our problem. Mm -hmm. Because if we're, if we're referring in like the actual, like the specific tables or the specific characteristics, features, the descriptive attributes of data themselves, we're getting down into a solutioning side of things rather than defining it at a higher level, which is our business focus, right? These are business stakeholders who are interfacing with IT and information engineering people at a level of, Solution. Yes, which, which we will talk about in in a minute. You know, yeah. by the way, your your crow feed is called cardinalities. <laughs> um, for those of you who are sticklers to write terms, but at, at the end of the oh, day, it's, it's it's both here on this on this this show. We can we can do whatever. <laughs> but it, it it defines the cardinality of the relationship. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that the one thing that you should keep in mind, no matter what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is set in stone. Yeah. Right? So you might come up with, say, 10 things. And in those 10 things, you say, okay, this is what I mean. If later on you realize, oh, wait a sec, that was a little bit too generic. You know, I need to split it into multiple entities by all means. Do mm -hmm. it. Well, this is meant to be an iter iterative process as well, right? Like we're defining solutions. That's where we're validating them with our stakeholder groups. And then we're going deeper as we go from conceptual to logical to physical. But we need to start, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but we need to start at the conceptual level so at least we can define the playing field upon which we are going to build. Yeah. And that's or the foundation upon which we're going to build. And that that leads me to a question about how to represent this. And particularly in these, these models, when you're talking talk a look at cardinality, do you want to represent multiple levels of a hierarchy? Like, are we... Are we defining categories? Are we defining subcategories? Are we getting into like a sort of a debate about how we organize our overall information engineering landscape? So on that level, I wouldn't do this, uh, okay. at least not now. You know, I would rather, and, and what you typically do is you draw a little uh, arrow that goes from that entity into the same entity, right? Mm -hmm. To indicate that there are multiple levels in there, right? right. So um I wouldn't do this because, again, the purpose is to understand what are the high-level things that we that we speak about, right? That the next step, and I also would not worry about the cardinalities, to be quite honest, at least not in the first iteration. At some point in time, yes, you know, um, it will be helpful when it comes to the implementation, right? Sure. In in bits and bytes, but not at that point in time. And you, 
like you said, it's iterative. You can always can go back. But I think that the next step that you would do is, and, and this is now where we move from conceptual more to a logical level, is you uh, have the entities and their relations defined from a business perspective. So now you want to go and you want to have the next level of detail, right? W what are the entities comprised of? And for this, you typically have the concept of uh, a logical attribute, right? So for example, if you have a purchase order, right? You have things like the vendor name, the vendor number, the vendor address, um, the receiver right. name, the receiver address, uh, the item name, the SKU of the item, you know, the package size, you know, do you get them as single uh, entities each, you know, or do you get a full palette of pencils, right? So the, 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 that is defined, right? So what you uh, can do there is you could say, okay, you um, take your entity and you decompose it. Think about like a tree or an UML. It's, it's a box and in the box you have those, those attributes in there, right? Um, what I like to do is I like to group those attributes as well. So in our PO, I would put a grouping level in between that says, oh yeah, this is the item information. Pencils, right. You know, oh, this is the, the vendor information. Oh, this is the receiver information. This is the PO information, you know, PO number and who approved yeah, yeah. and when and all that type of stuff. Right. So find a logical um, segmentation, right, in attribute groups and then define those attributes underneath because then you will see, oh, wait a sec, why do we have a vendor address in here, but we don't have for the receiver, right? So you can do that that logical cross-check, right? Right. And each of these uh, attributes are defined by further decomposition or at least further subclassification um, by key. Uh, so so you, can, you can start Could to des be. describe these in ways, well, you want to get a primary key, right? A descriptive, uh, descriptive primary key that it is your, you know, how each uh, entity is, identified and distinguished from each other entity. Mm -hmm. um, and you also want to understand, and particularly when you take a look at sort of preparing yourself for an integration scenario, when you're looking at lots of different spaces, where one attribute has a perhaps a foreign key, a descriptive attribute or primary key for some other thing that falls into this particular attribute. So that's something that can be yeah. uh, useful later on from like an integration perspective, understand what you're going to need to be able to ingest to be able to to hook these things together, right? Yeah, to, to make it a little bit clearer. So you, you typically have three different types of attributes. You have the descriptive attribute, you know, JM's birthday. Yeah. Um, you have a key attribute to stick with our purchase order. Most likely it's the purchase order number, yeah, right? Because that's, that's the thing that key. you want to trace, right? Yeah. And you might have a foreign key. The foreign key typically is the primary key of another entity. In my example, yeah. you might have a vendor table and the vendor has its primary key and you use that other primary key as a foreign key in your, um, in your logical data model to indicate, oh yeah, we pull the vendor information actually from somewhere else. It's defined, the master of the vendor, you know, is defined somewhere else because in our PO, we might just use a subset of all the attributes that the vendor might have, right? So you don't want to duplicate things, and therefore you use those three things. Although we are duplicating the entities between, or the attributes between two different spaces when we're looking at a foreign key. Like it might be a foreign key for this particular entity, but it might be the primary key for the other one. It is, I mean, that's why a relational database and a repository-based modeling system is very useful here because you can copy paste the actual attribute over and have a copy of it in different spaces. So if it changes, for instance, you can see the impact of that change. Yeah, but it's like an occurrence copy and you just yes. change the symbol. Right? Exactly. It's still pointing to the same object. I'm, Cor I'm with correct. you. Yeah, that, that's once again, that, like we, we, when we're talking about modeling things, we are, yes, there are digital paper that you can use to model this kind of thing, but we generally recommend and, and generally you know, aim towards repository-based modeling platforms or like relational database-based modeling platforms because this is very helpful in this kind of exercise when we look at both decomposition and interrelation. 
those two things that we're looking at when you look at the breakdown of a, an entity into its attributes and when you look at the reuse of attributes from foreign key to primary key. Mm-hmm. It, it, it helps. I wouldn't say it's a must. You know, you can do everything on a piece of paper. It's just more cumbersome <laughs> to do, right? Um, but um, so the, the model type, if you will, that you would use for this is an entity relationship diagram just to have it set, right? Or a UML diagram, right? UML, as we all know, has multiple uh, model types underneath. But um, one thing you can start at this point in time when you start thinking about the attributes, so the next level of the logical uh, data model, is now you could start thinking about, hey, what are the criteria for this? You know, is that is that attribute a text attribute, right? And and if so, how many characters do I need? You know, ten thousand, twenty four. Five? Hmm. You know, what what is it, right? Or is it a is it an integer? Is it a date? Is it a a, a value? You know, uh, that you want to have from a from a drop down list and all those things. So that's the moment when you start thinking about these things as a requirement. And as a requirement, Roland, I just want to loop back on this because I know there's lots of people screaming at their screens right now. Talk to me about the relationship between IT and the business at this specific point, defining data requirements based off of business scenario or based off of architecture realities? It's funny. I think at that point in time, a lot of people are lost. Everybody was wishing they had a babel fish in their ear because when you talk to, <laughs> to IT people, um, they are looking for, yeah, which field is it in which table, right? Which we come to a little bit later in this show, right? While the, the business guys say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care where you store that stuff, right? So there's a potential misunderstanding, right? And, and at this point in time, just to have it said, um, conceptual data models and logical data models are in business speech, right? right. So it's customer. It's not cust underscore blah, blah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So how you would label the field in a in a system. We, we get to this in a couple of minutes. But I, I bring this up because I have used in the past logical data models as an olive branch to mm-hmm. say, like, here, let me offer you some of the perspective the business has towards its data needs, IT team, data security team. Let's have a conversation with this as the focus so that you can bring up any red flags you see already here, or you can tell me what's available. So as a high level, you can, uh, you can say, okay, these are some things that would be easy for us to fulfill with our existing architecture. And if you go further down this road, or you want to define the, the format of this particular field in a very unusual way, it will take customization that will cost you money as part of this project. You probably don't want to spend or haven't planned on spending because you simply thought, Oh, making this a, spe- a special format, that's not a problem at all for IT. Well, it can be. The olive branch, right? But we, Yeah, but we, we're getting to this. But m- maybe we move on, you know? So we spoke about conceptual, we spoke about logical. Uh, now we're still on, on a logical level. Let's talk a little bit briefly about a canonical data model versus an information asset view. Um, and with that, I mean actually two things. One is... What we were speaking about the last couple of minutes was the con- conceptual and logical decomposition, you know, which is the canonical data model. You know, everything, right? A purchase order can have this and this and this, and you just accumulate uh, attributes on this. But then when you think about using them in a process, you don't always use everything of a purchase order, Right. So, for example, when you have in SAP, uh, when you have uh, an order for material, guess what? You have a product uh, attribute group, right? Remember when you said, okay, you have different attribute type groups uh, that describe, yeah, what is it? A pencil. Oh, uh, it has this skew. Uh, It is this packaging. It's this and this and this. It had this price and whatnot, right? Yeah, you would use this in a process when you buy goods. Well, right. when you buy services, no, you don't. There are no pencils. There are no goods to be to be sold. Well, in your logical, in your canonical data model, 
guess what? You have another attribute type group that then captures the service attributes, right? Because that's a different process right. later on, right? Or, God forbid, you have those free text purchase orders in SAP that, that everybody loves, you know? <laughs> um, so what you do is in your modeling, you do a mapping between your uh, entity and then you map those to clusters. And clusters are basically data objects in context. So you would right. have an entity called purchase order, and then you would have three clusters, a goods purchase order, a services purchase order, and a free text purchase order, right? And in your process diagrams, you would use the clusters, the cluster objects, and not the entities. Does that make sense, JM? It does, but but just to be clear then, each cluster would contain a subset of the entity and its attributes based off of its particular focus. Yes. But the entity is a superset of everything that could be captured about it. It's canonical, right? It's everything. W what I love about this is that in this way, we can actually try and look later on to try and understand in which clusters are parts of this canonical data model used. And mm -hmm. are there parts we defined that we aren't actually going to end up using? And I think we're going to mm -hmm. look at this a little bit in the data, in the, lo the logical or so the physical side physical. here. Yeah. But you know, there is so much uh, <laughs> extra information we see captured in different places that is a cost to capture and a cost to secure and a cost that we are paying without using the information. This is one of the levels of check a sort of sanity check. Should we be capturing this information? Do we even need it? Should we be putting this requirement on our IT systems to be able to hold this extra field? Or I mean, how many times have you gotten a piece of, of um, process mining data out of a system that contains like 400 columns? And you're like, what do 392 of these do? And the yeah. answer is, oh, we just capture this because that's what comes out of the system. Well, there's a, a non-zero cost to capturing storing, securing, transmitting, and using that or not using that data that you are just paying tacitly because you didn't define it. I agree. However, I don't think in, in today's time that whatever data storage cost and, and all those things are breaking the bank. You know, that's a thing of the <laughs> 80s and 90s. Uh, I think the, the older people remember Y2K, you know, the, yep. the, the, the two-digit year and all those things. So, I don't think that this is a big problem today, but... But but extra storage is, is breaking the back. No, the point is, yeah, you add complexity. <laughs> you add complexity to everything. And everybody's thinking about, oh, what does that mean? You know, and it could be simpler. I'm 100% I'm uh, with you on that. Um, the challenge with that that I see is, and I've seen projects fail in this, is when people start to, to do this as a big effort up front, right, to get things right. And, and at some point in time, they realize, oh, this is so complex. And I can't think about all those different contexts where this thing can happen. And then they just give up, right? So my recommendation, be agile with a lowercase a, right? Be agile, do it in iterations, go and, and continue on this. But keep in mind, you have the catalog, the canonical uh, model, and then you have your clusters, uh, which are a subset of those. Well, Roland, I got to be honest, at this point in time in the podcast, my data in my brain is getting all frazzled up and our listeners, hey, there's a conceptual object that I can put out there, are also getting a little frazzled up. So why don't we take a very brief break to let this data sit in their brains as we listen to some music, maybe calm the spirit. And then when we come back, we're going to hear a little bit more as we go from the logical to the physical and to the end use. We'll leave you for a moment and think about in this break how you've seen data categories created, data categories negotiated, and data categories in conflict.
and welcome back to the second segment of the show um, about data modeling. Um, maybe just one thing for clarification. If you have a hard time to follow or, or wonder what those two guys are babbling about, um, we have a couple of articles on whatsyourbaseline.com that have graphics, you know. So um, you can obviously reread all the stuff. You can have a look at the graphics that are there um, to follow the show when you listen to it the second time. But let's come back to um, our data modeling exercise. So we spoke about the canonical data model, which is conceptual and logical, you know, the decomposition. We spoke about the information asset view versus the canonical model, which is the data in context. And I'd like to give two examples uh, how you can use data in context as well. Right. The first one is when you think about it um, and you draw application landscapes. Right. So you have application yeah. A and then you have application B and you want to do some app rationalization and you want to know, well, do I need both? Do I need just one? Whatever. Right. And besides looking at capabilities and other criteria, you might want to look at what is the data that is used there, right? That is shipped from application A to application B. Right. Yeah, and, that, that's the interface view, right? We're going yep, to try and draw yep. that out and understand where those overlaps are in, in how we operate, not necessarily at the capability level, but simply like a data context level. Yep. And and what you want to do is you want to use those clusters that I just mentioned, you know, one of the three purchase orders in my example. You want to mm -hmm. model it in a way to say, okay, hey, this uh, application A sends Uh, the free text purchase order information to application B, right? Which yes. on the other side means it does not send the product and the services purchase orders. So, hmm, where do they those get <laughs> used, right? So let's ask another question that, that comes in. Oh, yeah. So w what you can do is in, in the modeling tools is obviously, like JM said, uh, go model your two apps, put that cluster in the middle, and then you can double click on the cluster. And guess what? You see an, an entity relationship diagram underneath that says, oh yeah, that the free text purchase order has these attributes, these logical attributes in there. I think that's a great value add for um, when you go into your solution design, because then you can obviously do an analysis afterwards and say, okay, did we use everything? You know, have we, have, we, have we have our backs covered, you know, um, or do we have some redundancies and, and all that type of stuff? It also gives you a sense of the context of any given application with its data landscape, right? Because mm -hmm. you're looking at application collaboration, so application to application, but now you stack up a whole bunch of application collaboration diagrams, and from any given application, you see all of the one jumps away, which are your data inputs and outputs, right? So I can see mm -hmm. here's everything coming in, here's everything going out that is tacitly created through individual application modeling or application to application modeling. And that's a really powerful feature because it means you don't have to think about everything at once, right? You think about each individual interface and then emergent from that is a picture that would be much too big for some individual human being to sit down and make on their own, right? You want to involve yeah. your stakeholders. Also, when you involve stakeholders, you're bringing them into individual interfaces, a thing you can own rather than the application, which is a thing people do own, but is much bigger and becomes a much more cumbersome and higher barrier to entry conversation starter. Yeah. And, and speaking of interfaces, <clears throat> there's another use for logical data models. You know, you can obviously use them <clears throat> to do some mappings. So for example, a couple of years ago, I worked with one of the big home loan companies and, and we were implementing a, a process modeling tool. And as part of that, uh, we had to bring in uh, application info from ServiceNow. Right? So the first exercise that we did was where we had to look at what is the logical data structure of an app in ServiceNow. And lo and behold, it was like 70 or 80 uh, snippets of information that they captured there. And, and we had a first look and said, uh, we don't need everything, right? We need those 15 or 20, you know? So that was the first benefit of having that, that logical data model, that ERM diagram, right? Identifying yeah. that you don't need 80% or 
my math is bad, 75% of, of all the information that, that ServiceNow is capturing. And then we were mapping it uh, to, well, how do we bring that information into the modeling tool and map it to that entity that we called application? Right. right. So uh, w- what we did is we created a big matrix diagram. And on the one hand side, we had uh, in the in the rows, we had, I forgot what it was, the service now information for the apps. And in the columns, we had the, the modeling tool information. And one of them was application. And then we were looking at those requirements, you know, an application in the process modeling tool needs to have a name and needs to have this and this and this. And then we tried to map it and just put little check marks in the in the cells where, where we had everything we could rationalize, you know, were we able to bring those 15 or 20 service now attributes into the tool? Oh, and if not, well, we had a requirement to enhance the meta model of the modeling tool, right? To yeah. say, okay, yeah, give me some custom attributes that we then called whatever the name of that attribute in service now was. That was very helpful. And, and what we did is we maintained those matrices uh, very diligently over the course of the whole program. Mm-hmm. And and because one of the big exercises, and, and this is what we did with another client um, earlier than that, a, a large North American bank, uh, we had like 29 different systems that uh, we put in the same process modeling tool in this case. Um, and that was obviously super complex, right? So we want to make sure, oh, yeah, if you have policies and risks and controls and blah, whatever it was, that we exactly knew what we were talking about. Right, so that's that's another use case for logical data modeling, um, without going onto the level of physical uh, data model, which I think is the next topic that we talk about. It is. I wanted to just put one more thing in here, which is why this kind of in, uh, matrix is so powerful. Is it also gives you a sense of subscribership? Like, how many places do you find this piece of data? And in in some ways, it helps you to rationalize. Say, hey, you're not using this very much. Is this actually necessary? Mm-hmm. What can we rationalize down? In some ways, it, it, we use it to recognize. Like, hey, data owner, you know, look at this piece of data. Here's all the different places it serves. So you, what you're doing has significant and specific business value. I can show that because I can see all of your consumers that's a good feeling. And once again, we talk about these all of branches to connect business to IT. This is another place you can go and recognize to reward and receive an, a buy-in from your partners across the aisle, if you would think of it like that. Agreed. In a lot of yeah. organizations, they are across the aisle, which kind of sucks. But yeah, that's a longer conversation we've had many times. <laughs> Agreed. And, and, and you brought in the role of a data owner. You know, which is yes. also rarely seen, a very rare species, but needed. So needed. Why, yep. why, why is it like, it feels like that's the last thing people want to hire. They want to hire a bunch of more BAs and put them on process analysis and they want to hire a bunch of EAs and they want to put them on like IT system maintenance and keeping the lights on. No one owns the relationship. No one owns the, like no one is a, as much a data steward as they mm-hmm. are sort of like the obligation of data interlock for security purposes. I don't know. It just feels But this is this is a complete, well... A tangent in our conversation today, where we can talk about another two hours, and yes. I like to continue because we have a little bit more nuggets that that we want to yeah. that we want to talk about. So let Let's us bring back physical. Yes, we we're getting there because now, obviously, the next logical question and think about that diagram that I spoke before the application uh, uh, interfaces. Right, application A sends a cluster to application B. Um, well, the logical question is. Um, where is it stored, right? So, so what you typically do is in an EA tool, you obviously have your application and it has a, a bunch of information. You know, what is the operating system and what's the database system and who owns it and, and whatnot. So you create those profiles, right? But one thing that I have very, 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 very rarely seen is the decomposition of the physical data structure in the tool. Hmm. Right. And that typically is comprised into a structured data model, structured physical data model. So you have um, tables and those tables have fields. Right. And um, what I'd like to do is um, when we get to the physical data modeling, I, is I'd like to create a table diagram. 
right? So right. what are the tables in that relational database? And the one thing that you will see is when you do that exercise, and, and I did that in a in a large uh, a diagram with, I don't know how many tables I had in there. But then I said, okay, well, we spoke about a little bit earlier about keys and foreign keys, right? So that indicates a relationship, right? So now in that table diagram, I must have an arrow going from table A to table B, right? Yep. And and when I took a step back from that huge data model that I had, guess what? There were a bunch load of arrows going into a table called customer. So somehow <laughs> that customer was important, right? Yeah. So so that's, a, that's the first thing, right? So you want to understand what is, and, and obviously you want to rationalize this with your IT folks, you know, is that actually true? Right? Is there a relationship in the database between those two tables, or or did Roland just made it up on a piece of virtual paper? Right? You want yeah, to resolve I mean, that too. Roland, they 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 often have this kind of modeling, if not modeling done, at least tacitly it is done inside application systems. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I had a guest a couple of episodes back, it said the most common form of process standardization is automation. I would say. Uh, conversely, the most common form of, of data modeling is is uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. You simply did it, and that's the way it works. And so whether or not you have the diagrams doesn't change whether or not the tables work that way. It just changes whether or not you can effectively communicate how they work to your various business partners, solve problems before they come up, and be able to build a collective solution that actually achieves business goals. Well, wouldn't it be great, right? And, and you know, when I start a sentence like this, the answer only can be yes, you know. <laughs> wouldn't it be great? And we spoke about that in the enterprise modeling episode with Mark McGregor. Wouldn't it be great that there were tools who can recreate those diagrams based on what's actually running in a system? Ooh, yes, it would be. I'd yeah, like so I, I haven't seen any. I'm pretty sure there's some out there, you know, um, but not in, in the, the tool space that I've worked in in the past, right? So something like data mining. Right from the applications. Yeah, I um, actually, I actually have a story about data mining. I did a data mining project a few years ago for a big pharma company, and what we did was we did data flow mining. Mm -hmm. So it's actually like instead of building process models, we built data flow models based off of transactions we saw of data movement that presented a similar way to the way you would see a process mining log. But instead, yeah. it was a data transactional log. It was actually quite an interesting experiment. I mean, you know, it was a, honestly the only time I've ever done that. But it was an interesting conversation starter because we also put that side by side with the process mining data. Mm -hmm. So we had those two sort of overlaid with each other to see like what data flows match up with what steps in the transactions of our systems. And that gave a ton of information about what was being moved where and what entities were relevant or important because that was captured as an attribute of the the data movement transaction, which yeah, I think is cool. That, that makes sense, but you created it manually. I'm I talking did. about a systemic, you know, an automated yeah. way of doing this. But let's come back to, to our regular programming. Please. Um, so when we talk about table diagrams, remember that I gave that example with the, the German Armed Forces um, about um, not only where data is stored, Right, but are there data transformations happening? And where does that transformed data get stored? Well, guess what? The table diagram gives you a home where you can then put those temporary tables in there. And that poor SAP employee who gave that suboptimal answer uh, would have been much better off in that situation if he could have pulled out a table <laughs> diagram and say, hmm, let me have a look. And he followed just that line on that diagram and says, sure, Mr. Client, no big deal. You know, we, we take this data and it, it gets also stored in those three other tables, you know, and then yeah. everybody would have been happy. You know, um, I'm pretty sure regulators like that information as well. But uh, the, the second thing that you want to do is um, also uh, maybe you have a table object in a table diagram, right? And you do a similar thing with the, compared to the entities that you decompose into the attributes. Well, guess what? You create another table diagram where you decompose your table into its fields, right? Where you then see the cust underscore blah, 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 physical table name. Right. right, and and 
uh, what you can do is, and now comes the, the thing full circle, you can obviously go and take your logical attributes that you modeled from a business perspective, and then you try to match them up, right? And, and what are the benefits of this, right? You get a, a completeness check, you know? Did all my logical attributes find a home, right? Or um, not, you know, do I miss something? Do I lose the business information because I don't store it, right? Or vice yeah. versa, you rationalize, hey, I got those other columns in, in my tables. For what, right? And if it's not well documented, somebody else might use this for whatever and and back you go and your <laughs> database structure is, is suboptimal. Can I give you an example of where that actually was really helpful? Mm -hmm. I work with a... Um, an over-the-road transport company who, who actually did a lot of train shipping. And one thing they found through doing this kind of modeling, but they also found when they were talking to their operators, is a key field was not being represented in the tables that printed out the incoming or the inbound uh, sort of uh, the, the contents sheet for mm -hmm. receivers at the depot when the train came in. The thing they weren't printing out was number of cars. So oh. that field was simply not replicated. So what they used to do, and this was the workaround that we discovered when we have a long conversation after modeling this out, is they would send a guy out with a truck and who would count the number of cars and then radio that to the depot. Mm -hmm. And that was how they worked around it. For years they did that yeah. until we discovered, hey, wait a second, there's a field that has that in it. It's just not being passed to this table. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing. The the other thing that I that I've seen is if we talk about that funny thing, I've I've had I was working in a project where we had a homegrown risk application, and and while they were developing the risk application, we did that exercise of mapping the logical attributes to the field. There was one field that had some I forgot what the name was, but it was some Google Gook, you know, and I would have never in twenty lifetimes have figured out what that field meant, you know? So yes, the developer knew it. Oh yeah, we used it for this, but then we changed it to uh, how's this information? And and it was never changed, the damn field name, you know? So that is obviously not not good when you go to uh, analysis. Yeah, actually there's like one more example if I wouldn't mind putting in there, because you and I worked on this together was there was a process mining project we worked on together where the name of the step that was occurring was a combination of other fields concatenated mm -hmm. codes that added up to a second tables information keying that had what that actual step was. And the people who knew the second and the first were different sets of people which means people watching transactions had no idea what was happening and people who knew what was happening had no idea what the transactions were. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had a similar I had a similar situation in, in another process mining project where you and I didn't work together with. But yes. Uh, yeah. Um but but at this point in time now when we when we say okay we we've defined the tables we've defined the fields now we also come full circle because now comes the question of well what are the the I don't know, lack of a better word, the, the attributes, the formats of the fields. You know, is it text? How many characters? Is it a date? Is it a, a number? You know, oh, by the way, is it double or is it integer and, and all that type of stuff, right? So at that point in time, when you have done that mapping of the, the logical, the, the physical field with the logical attribute, well, you just read what the business person thought it should be stored in, and then you compare it uh, as the IT person with the actual properties of your field. Right. And hopefully they match. Right. And you can rationalize this as well. Um, that obviously helps to get the requirements much better. Right. When you actually hand it over to, to somebody, then do some stuff. And lastly, what you do is you, you with all that modeling, right, you create a traceability that is valuable, for example, in regulatory obligation scenarios, you know, yeah, like absolutely. data privacy and you know, all those type of things. And, and I think that, that this is a re relevant to take us to the next conversation because one of the other things you do with all of this work is you lead data from the realm of the academic or the realm of the very technical, like, you know, how, how does this work in the background 
to the very front end, which is what, what does this look like when we actually use Mm -hmm. it? So Mm -hmm. I want to take us from conceptual, logical, physical to actual data usage and representation in interfaces. Mm -hmm. And I think the most common type of interface that anyone will be interacting with is a screen. Everyone's interacting with them all the time. Somebody designed those screens. There are buttons on it. There's information on those screens. All of the things you're seeing are data elements we have previously spoken about. Yeah. So we're getting basically to the third question of of what I said in the beginning. You know, we've defined what the data is, the conceptual and the logical stuff with all the little examples that we had. We just spoke about the physical data, you know, tables, fields, that type of stuff. Now we get to the question where where is it used, you know? So, um, and, and you're absolutely right, you know? I think that the most obvious one is when you look at uh, screens, right? And um, when you think about modeling processes, you know, in some tools, they allow you to put a screen uh, in as a, as a relationship to that process step. Right? Yeah. And um, uh, you obviously then see the data mapping in there. Well, because also screens are how you interact with it, right? Like when you're going through a process, the screen matches up with the step and the screen matches up with the data. So now we're keying it all together, right? Through that that interface. Yeah, this, this, now I have multiple ideas on this. Obviously, yes, you have that, that individual step in your process, right? And you have your screen there. But you also think about, when you think about customer journeys, right? You want to rationalize, oh, oh yeah. is the sequence of my screens correct? You know, um, is it is it confusing when we think about screen design? You know, do I want to lead people in a certain way? So what you typically do is you uh, create, if your tool does that, and just a few modeling tools do this, um, is you can create what's called screen diagrams, right? Those screen diagrams then are basically like a, like a, low fidelity mock-up you know every one of us has has seen those quick fixes you know where you see a rectangle and somebody says oh yeah this is name (laughs) you know but what they do is um when you think about it you have that that mock-up of the the wire screen the wireframe yes and uh then on the one hand side you just map those fields to your logical attributes yes we're talking about the vendor name we're not talking about the recipient of the purchase order, right? Or we're talking about the vendor address, not the recipient uh, address. That mm. obviously could be could be quite a difference, right? And then what you also can do is in in those screens, you can have uh, objects that represent buttons, right? That say, okay, what's the next step? You know, what happens if I if I press next versus what happens if I press escape or cancel? Yeah, right. So they definitely they definitely help, you know, and um, and using uh, process tools that give you that extra information is obviously very helpful compared to using a standalone wireframe tool. Don't want to name names here, but obviously, yeah, yeah, if you yeah. have everything in the same database, it's it's obviously helpful. And I think this is our last like sort of level of connectedness check. Like, do the wireframes from like a UX experience, like a user experience, UI, user interface perspective, do they match up with our available data fields or are we still missing stuff? Can we go back and fix it after? Because yeah. you, you talked, like you offered at the very beginning of this conversation that this was an iterative discussion. And now we're at the last part of the discussion. So obviously mm-hmm. it's the most expensive to fix here, but it's still possible. It's still iterative. Hey, I want a specific field available here. It's important for my customer's experience. I'm going to make the pitch that we need to go back and we need to look at our logical or our physical, then our logical, then our conceptual, make sure it all syncs up so I can get this one other piece of information available on this one screen. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Definitely. Um, And and you're absolutely right. Iterative is the way to go. That's one more thing before we get to a close. Um, One diagram type that I would love to uh, present uh, because I think it, it really makes sense. So when you think about it, um, say you do an order process, right? You could create your customer experience uh, diagrams, right? Your journeys. Um, you could create process diagrams, right? To say, oh, you do this and this and this. The one model type that I would 
propose that you also do is you take those screens that we use uh, mapping to the steps and put them into a screen diagram and then model out what are the connections between the different screens. Remember, they do have buttons. You know, what happens if I click on, on this button? Well, what's the next screen that I go to versus I click on the other button? What happens then? Do I go to a different one, right? Yeah. And what you want to do is you want to obviously overlay that with your processes, right? Because you want to make sure that, yeah, we're talking about those four screens in a row, but they also interact with others, right? And and one exercise, and um, I need to look at the, the article that I wrote, the example that I had. Hopefully the quality is good enough. Um, it was like um, the Amazon example. You know, where, where do you start, right? How do you find a thing that you want to buy? Oh, wait, you have it on the home screen, right? You get some stuff recommended by uh, Amazon, right? Or you search yeah. for it, you know, or you click through the categories, whatever. These are all different screens up to the point where you end up on that individual item that you might want to buy. And then, oh, by the way, there's another sales process, you know, you put it in your shopping cart. Yeah. After that shopping cart, you might want to continue shopping or you want to check out, you know. So the screen navigation models are very helpful in rationalizing also uh, how those screens play together. And obviously you can, since everything is connected with everything, you can double click on one of those screen objects and it shows you the wireframe. And in the wireframe, you see the logical data and you see the functions and all that wonderful stuff. And this actually syncs up nicely with one of the, one of the topics I've been speaking about at a couple of different conferences over the past year, which is customer journey modeling. Because you want to be able to connect what you're seeing from the web trackers and monitoring systems that you're going to use for customer journey modeling, like how long did they linger on the screen? What button did they click? Where did they go? Where did they loop back? When did they exit their session based on the cookie data you have from their interactions with your site? You want to be able to sync that up with the screens they were on, understanding what patterns they might go down. And once again, connect that with the rest of your data landscape so that you understand when you're going to have to migrate from screen to screen to screen, making certain data available, syncing it up with a customer journey and process, and ultimately being able to see where it's struggling. So when early exits to the process, or they call it abandoned shopping carts is a, a good example of that, um, happen, or when you go to a successful close of a sale um, for customers. So it, it is, I think this is a really good thing to ties all of it together. I know that we've been burning brains for almost an hour now. And Roland, I think we, we've gotten to uh, a good place for us to, to take a, another brief break before we come back, summarize, take some of our key lessons learned, final thoughts, and close the episode. But before we do that, we'll leave you for a moment with your brains to think about some of the things we've talked about today. First and foremost is think about how you design experiences and the data that comes to make those experiences real. What screens are you asking your customers to click through? What processes are they on? What data appears on those screens? What tables does that data get pulled from? And how do you make sure that data is available to your UI UX designers? We'll leave you for a moment and come back with our final thoughts and conclusions. And welcome back. And, and I'm pretty sure a lot of uh, heads are spinning now. You know, you see little steam <laughs> coming out of some gray matter in, in your brains. Um, fear not, fear not. As I said earlier, we have uh, four articles about data modeling on whatsyourbaseline.com. I will add the URLs to the show notes. They include not only text, they also include pictures because everybody wants to see diagrams and examples and all that type of stuff. And if you have questions on that, um, please don't be shy. Reach out to JM and I. We're happy to uh, chat with you and give you little pointers where, where things might be. 
And just as a reminder for you, you know, what's your baseline.com is a great place to go for lots of information. We, you know, today we spoke about our, our taking conceptual to logical to physical to screen usage of data, but there's so much more to discover. So feel free to visit us at what's your baseline.com. Come see us up at LinkedIn. Um, hit us up with questions. We love responding to questions and comments. And as always, please make sure to share this podcast with some of your friends from the business or IT world who might want to know a little bit more about the way that we see the world of business data, business process, enterprise architecture, and everything in between. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Roland, and thank you as always for your thought leadership and expertise. I'm looking forward to hearing lots of our feedback from our friends all over the world. And if you want to find out more about the specific episode, it's whatsyourbaseline.com slash episode 65. But we'll see you soon, friends. And until then, I've been J.M. Erlinson. And my name is Roland Wold. And we'll see you in the next one.